Hello, I'm Clinton. Welcome to Media Ecology for the Online Community as Classroom. Today, right now, billions of minds are being tethered together all willy-nilly. Billions of individuals are shaping and being shaped by one another at a rapidity with which institutions can hardly keep pace. All of us on the internet are building a world together right now, and this world is quickly becoming the world. The amount of information and breadth and scale of communication which digital devices grant us demand a form of literacy and responsibility. Ways of properly perceiving the whole, which is to say, indirectly conceiving ourselves in light of the whole, are essential. But where to start? Fortunately, answers are to be found everywhere. And for me, the answer has been a street smart media ecology. In the 1960s, Marshall McLuhan said that, with the advent of television, more learning was done outside of the classroom than in it. For unstructured learning today, online communities are where it's at. And in participating in them responsibly, we will find Marshall McLuhan an ideal guide. He is the central, if off-center, figure in the field of media ecology, which studies the role technology and media plays in our lives as parts of our greater environment. In the first part of this series, we'll go over the life of this Canadian English professor who loved words so much that he based an entirely new field of study on them. Like words, Marshall McLuhan saw all forms of media and technology as expressions and extensions of ourselves, ways of reaching into and grasping the world which our senses report to us, and vice versa. We will go over some of his major influences and interests so as to get an idea of the problem being addressed, and then we will consider the solutions which McLuhan posited. The problem is represented by the metaphor of the media maelstrom. It is consciousness lost in a dizzying, vertiginous whirlpool which has grown to encompass all of the world since the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s. Derived from a short story by Edgar Allan Poe, the maelstrom refers to the failure of our senses to restabilize after all of our intuitions intuitions are knocked off kilter by disorienting developments in media like photography, telegraph, cinema, radio, telephones, and television. Not only does the old way of sensing stop working, but how to even perceive the new way requires fundamental changes in our sensory apparatus. Compounding this problem, our old way of sensing the world is captured by new media as a way to perceive its content. Instead of seeing the new, we see the old thing within the new. To look at a painting or a television or to listen to streaming music, we will notice the content first, the image, the picture, or the instruments, the music, the paint strokes, or the pixels, or the audio compression algorithm, which all, they, they would be secondary considerations if we're conscious of them at all. Our senses are superficial by default. The new environment, which takes forms of sensation we lack the incentive to develop, remains invisible while they play pretend at being the old familiar thing that we grew up with. Right now we got computers that pretend to be televisions. We got computers that pretend to be cell phones. If you don't train yourself to see the new thing, you're going to be living in the past. In addition, mechanization, advertisements, propaganda, spectacular media, and the incessant bombardment of all the world's ideas and cultures and histories and news upon our persons leave us, they, well, they leave our rational faculties bouncing about in our brains in fragments, unable to synthesize comprehensive thoughts. We resort to mythological thinking and conception. Without words and art which trains our senses, in this chaos, we are helpless but to be living largely unconsciously. In the face of science, industry, and mass production's erosion of traditional human beliefs and values, the solution 
of the romantic poets of the 1800s, a return to nature did not work. After careful consideration and years of planning and thinking, McLuhan's proposal was the development of ways of navigating the maelstrom, called media literacy. Its end goal was the establishment of a sensus communis, or common sense. This is a concept he takes from Aristotle. The main idea is that people don't come together by empathizing with each other directly. Communication isn't a person-to-person -person operation, transporting messages back and forth. Instead, it is a shared perception, a co-created common sense of what is fundamental and stable and true. All that we come about together on anyway, without even noticing. Common sense comes with the verifiable integrity of touch and sight and sound all in interrelation. The dream is that through good artwork, true words, self-education, and responsible conscious ownership and use of our technology, the human created world itself might be made into something sensibly steady and stable, providing the mind objects of contemplation which allow for personal orientation. In our age of radio waves and microelectronics, much that is real, tangibly real, is still beyond our senses to immediately pick up. A sense for all that is real but remains invisible, like radio waves and microelectronics or germs and carbon monoxide, must be trained. You have to learn to feel things you can't even sense. But even before then, like even before that, we ha have to not forego the obvious, because it is the obvious most taken for granted thing that is at the risk of erosion if not recognized and notice of it is not renewed. Knowing what we've got before it's gone is the key and that takes conscious articulation. Having to go around stating the obvious to reestablish common sense is essential. Every new generation grows up needs to appreciate what it is that's already taken for granted by the one preceding it. And that's passed down. And the world is full of so many more things that we can all come together on. So many more things that we all share in common than that last resort of the lost and the damned, the common enemy. Instead of continuing to allow necessity to force our hand in regard to what brings people together, we must be proactive conscious about all that it is we already share lest we lose it well I'm getting pretty romantic I guess but I think it's a good ideal to set our sights upon because it's realistic it's doable and it's about what's real the starting point is to find out what's undeniably real and that we all share and we all ought to agree on and what's one thing that we all share well I'll tell you what we all got our faces buried in screens all day. And that's what this show is about. Computer literacy for the purposes of media ecology. We're going to get a sense of the digital devices as media in and of themselves. Instead of the content. Please shut up about apps. Just forget the apps. You're not ready for apps. If you don't understand Alan Turing's conception of a universal machine and how it's embedded in all of these devices. If you don't know, like, if you don't know what a programmable computer is, I don't know why you own one. I don't know who the hell gave you a pocket-sized supercomputer, but I know you're not licensed for that thing. And so this will be your safety course for the sake of my peace of mind. We're going to track how the Turing machine gets buried beneath the evolving interfaces of microcomputers from the 1970s to the present day. This will give us a peek behind the illusory extensions of our physical environments which modern computer interfaces simulate. So this is the story of cyberspace, the merging of virtual objects and real space. I already did a whole series on this, uh, documentary style, called Silicon and Charybdis. Go check it out. Um, but we have to go through it here in a more, uh, you know, explicit context. Once we understand smart devices and social media as merely the latent incarnation of the almost unchanging, decades-old machines that they really are, once we stop looking at them, as rapidly obsolesced disposable consumer flotsam of the maelstrom that they keep being marketed as, then we'll have established some rock solid historical and technical grounding upon which to stand and breathe and take a break. From this anti-environment of perception of technology that we build, an anti-environment is what McLuhan would call it, 
we can open all new avenues for exploration in our connected age. We will still be using McLuhan's media theory, which posits all technologies and media as extensions of ourselves and electronic media as extensions of our nervous system. We'll have to update that for the digital age. We will compare what it means to sense computers as physical devices that are programmable versus computers as magic portals to otherworldly cyberspace. This is going to take us a far ways toward grasping a lot of contemporary thinking on like transhumanism, post-humanism, all these theories. And that's because, I dare say, McLuhan is the point of inception for many of these theories. But don't worry, it's just metaphoric on this channel. Like the ideas, uh, what, what we'll be studying um, will help us learn about technology in a way that lets us keep a safe distance from technology see it for what it really is. We can up the resolution on our thinking about our devices so as to be conscious about our uses of them. This is like, this is a, uh, you know, no subconscious merging with the machine going on here, please. This series is pro-human, cyborg weary. If you want to be led around by the nose by machines your whole life, at least I'm trying to help you make the decision more fully informed. And then, only after laying all of that groundwork, once we know just what computers are and where they come from, will we finally be able to actually talk about online communities and learning and social media and internet flame wars and trolls and shame brigades and traditional media and all that stuff and all that stuff. But it's very silly to talk about things when you haven't to handle on what's going on beneath your nose. I don't know why you all don't understand computers yet. I don't know who to blame for it. But, you know what, blame is not productive. You need to understand computers, and so we're going to do it right here. Um, in the style of Marshall McLuhan. You can support this channel uh, at subscribestar.com slash clintonthegeek or patreon.com slash clintonthegeek. Uh, I'd really appreciate it, and uh, because we've got a lot of ground to cover here, and it's not just about having the facts, it's about synthesizing them together, making sense of it all, which is what I've been doing a lot of work on in the past few years. So, uh, the next episode, we will dig into um, the early life of Marshall McLuhan and look at uh, the works of Siegfried Gideon. And I think we'll be able to fit in Wyndham Lewis, too. Yeah, yeah. I should be able to get that all in less than 15 minutes. Uh, it's going to be jam packed full of good stuff. Blow your mind. Uh, looking forward to it. Until next time, take care and stay safe in the media maelstrom. Later.